To me, music is an appealing object of study because it is so often at the heart of how we express things that are central to being human, especially faith, love, and identity. A music historian uses music as a window into the ways in which different societies viewed the world around them and how they marked important occasions and changes in their lives. My particular area of interest is in what we often call lyric. Lyrics are poems, but they're poems that are destined to be sung. The word lyric ultimately refers back to the ancient mythological figure Orpheus, who was known to sing and accompany himself on a lyre, which is like a small harp. Famously, Orpheus's voice was so beautiful that through song he was able to convince the god of the underworld to return his wife to the living. Orpheus and his lyre represent the capacity for song to move us, to persuade us, and even to overcome death. So when we refer to poems as lyrics, we acknowledge the special power they exert on our emotions and our actions. My research focuses on the songs of the Middle Ages, particularly the musical tradition that begins with the singer-songwriters known as the troubadours, and stretches from the 12th through the 14th centuries and beyond. Medieval lyrics survive in hand-copied books or manuscripts. I examine the interrelationships between different lyrics, studying how they're written down in their manuscripts, comparing their melodies, and examining their themes and how different poets express these themes. At the moment, I'm very interested in springtime. I've been comparing the ways different medieval poets describe springtime landscapes in their lyrics. The French nobleman and songwriter Gas Brule, for example, begins many of his songs with a description of himself standing alone in a beautiful natural landscape, listening to the song of birds, and surveying his estate. I've been interested in songs like this one as a window into changes in the way medieval people experienced landscape and changes in the way they made use of the lands on which they lived. What I have found as I undertook this project with the OU Humanities Forum is that many medieval songwriters were increasingly estranged from the natural world as Western Europe's population grew and became much more urban. My research has shown that songwriters who lived in cities like Paris were far less likely to describe the springtime in their songs. This is predictable since the forests and meadows and gardens that had been close at hand just a generation earlier had been cleared to fulfill the needs of the growing city. Hearing a nobleman like Gas Brule sing about the beauty of the trees and meadows around him is a reminder that unlike noble landowners, fewer and fewer medieval people had access to nature as the 13th century progressed. These are themes I will continue to trace next year when I'll be writing a book on medieval lyric with the support of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Medieval society was fundamentally unlike modern American society, whether we consider its monarchies, its rigid class system, or its limited technologies. Particularly when I teach medieval music to students here at OU, I try to help them see how medieval culture forces us to confront these radical differences, but also to notice surprising commonalities. The deforestation of 13th century France, for example, evokes the state of environmental degradation we currently face across the world. Rather than viewing continuities like this one as a cause for despair, though, I tend to find comfort in the comparison. Studying the Middle Ages can reveal that there are certain things that are just intrinsic to our nature as human beings, but it can also reveal that the aspects of our society we consider basic, fundamental, and virtually unchangeable 
have been completely different in the past and could be altered again.